Won't you remain standing with me and open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 55, verse number 11. It's good to see you today. A full house, amen. I hope that you have had a good week. I had a good week. I drove courteous everywhere that I went. Did not cut anyone off. This morning I want to speak to you on the subject, becoming a voice again. Becoming a voice again. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 11. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void. We're not talking about our words. We're talking about his words. But it shall accomplish what I please. I mean, you know, when God talks, it, does, it accomplishes what he pleases. And it shall prosper. Come to fruit in the thing for which I sent it. Let's pray. God, I come today. And God, I, I want only to share your word. God, would you use me? God, would you use me? Would you speak to your people today? God, would you challenge our hearts? God, would you impact our lives today? God, would you speak? God, let your voice be heard. God, I surrender to you and I ask you for the outpouring of the Holy Ghost in this moment, in this, in this hour today, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, I, I, I want to talk to you about becoming a voice again, and my heart is yearning for the church to find her voice. The church is still the best hope that we have. Amen? And we hear all around us how, how, how it's sad, the sad state of the voice of the church. And this morning, I just simply want to ask the question, how can the church become a strong voice again? <coughs> I believe that the church of Cleveland is, is clearing her throat, if you will. You know how before you get, to sp get up to speak and you might be a little nervous, you kind <clears> of, <throat> and, and you prepare yourself. Right, Juno? Show, show us how you do it one time. Juno is the, the, the throat clearing champion. If you've ever been around him, if you've ever sat in his Sunday school class, and if you've never been through his class and you miss first base, you need to go get plugged into the new Christians class and get a foundation to grow on. Amen? You want your foundation not to be on sand, but on the stone. It's just a commercial for the throat-clearing, Bible-believing, disciple-making Chris Juno right there. I believe that the church of Cleveland is beginning to clear her throat because the church is about to say something. Has, has a voice to say into this. A couple weeks ago, we had our second community-wide prayer meeting, and, and three of our pastors, Pastor Travis Hewlett and Pastor Nelson Torres and Pastor Carl Williamson, a white, a Hispanic, and an African-American pastor, they linked arms in a circle, and, and one by one, they repented on behalf of their race for all racism towards the others. And I want you to know that was powerful. It was powerful. At that moment, there was a voice for the church of Cleveland. At that moment, there was a sound, a cry, that came out of that place into this community, in, in a community that has been in bondage with racism for years. But how incredible is it that the church is leading the way in that regard? That the church says, you know what, we understand that there's an issue. We understand that there are issues. They might not be as bad as they're portrayed by the media. They might be as bad as in our own homes. But when we look at our city, we see there's an issue. And so we, we, we realize the issue and we will lead the way in repentance. That's how the church has a voice. This morning, I, I want to talk to us about how can we get back to having a voice again. It's a really simple explanation, but a tough, tough implementation. It's easy to say, but it's hard to do. Because here's, what, here's what, I, I, I know, what I've learned is that God gives us the platform and he also gives us the voice. See, it's kind of a play on words that the church would have a voice because the church is never really to have a voice anyway. The church is simply to be the echo of his voice. And the greatest voice the church could ever have would be to echo that, that it says, I have heard from God, and this is what God would say. So this morning, how can we get back to having a voice? Well, it's got to start with hearing his voice. 
And that's where I, I want us to kind of step back a couple steps to end up where we're talking about having a voice again. The, the, the Bible story that came to mind that I studied this week is that of Nehemiah. Because Nehemiah was in a very similar situation. So if you'll flip over to Nehemiah chapter 1, we're going to spend some time there. <clears throat> We've got to hear the voice to share the voice. Amen. Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 1 says, The words of Nehemiah the son of Hakaliah came to pass in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan the citadel, that Hananiah, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The New Living Translation says that, that the survivors there in captivity, that the survivors are in great trouble and disgrace. Whenever your city can't defend itself because its walls are torn down, it was a disgrace. We're talking about the people of God. We're talking about the church. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. So here's what's going on with Nehemiah. God used an evil king to bless his people. God can use whoever he wants. God took a, an evil king who had taken captive the people of Israel and he said, you know what, we need to rebuild the temple of God that we destroyed. And he sends back a group in the book of Ezra to go and to begin reconstructing the temple. And they lay the foundation, but then they start suffering attacks. The enemy become, uh, begins to come in and devastate them. The enemy comes and, and attacks them. Every time that they're trying to work on the temple, the, the enemy comes and ravishes their land. Well, why would the enemy come? Because they were doing a work for the Lord. Why does the enemy come in our lives? Because we're doing a work for the Lord. And so the, the enemy had full access to the people of God because their walls were torn down. <clears throat> they were trying to do something good and they couldn't get it off the ground because of the enemy. Does this sound familiar? Is this what's happening with the church today? It seems like the greatest attack in our day and time is against those that are trying to do a work for the Lord. Every other group is defended except for those that are trying to do a work for the Lord. And they're wide open. So Nehemiah gets this report and immediately he begins to respond in prayer. And what we see is he becomes a voice. And so this morning, I just want to, to look through this first couple chapters of Nehemiah, and I see three things. I see that it was fix, find, and follow. The first one is fix. We must fix the breach that is preventing us from hearing God's voice and causing our voice to be silenced. We have to hear his voice to have a voice. But I wonder today, how many in the church are actually hearing the voice of God? The issue is not with the one speaking, it's with the one listening. But have we heard from God? And if not, what's blocking our ears? See, there's a two-part problem that we need to fix. First part is we can't hear because of sin in our life. That is, we have chosen sin that has separated us from God. And now we're not in intimacy. Now we're not as close as we once were. And, and this sin is clogging our ears. Right? Well, God needs to take his Q-tip and just run it in there and run it right back out. That's called repentance, right? We're going to talk about that in a moment. But, but here's the second part of that problem. The same sin that has caused us not to hear is the same sin that is disqualifying our voice for those we're trying to reach. Because they say, why would you tell me when you've got issues in your own house? Why would you speak into my life when yours is a wreck? And we're guilty, church. Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 4, so it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven and I said, I pray Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open that you may hear the prayer of your servant which I pray before you now day and night for the children of Israel, your servants. And confess the sins of the children of Israel which we have sinned against you. Both my, father's I, both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you. And have not kept the commandments, the statutes, or the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Nehemiah's immediate, immediate response when he heard about the condition of the land 
when he heard about the attack of the enemy, was to go and to begin to pray. And he doesn't start out like a lot of us do and say, God, why are you letting this happen? God, why would this happen to me? I believe that the enemy attacks, and sometimes the, the enemy attacks you when there's nothing wrong in your life. I'm not voiding that. But a lot of the issues in our own life, we bring upon ourselves. And when we give access to the enemy, we, we, we have, then we would ask God, why did you let the enemy come? Why did you let the enemy come? Right? Jesus teaches us to pray, lead us not into temptation. Well, my problem a lot of time is I'm the one running there. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. If we're leading ourselves into temptation, what is our expectation? <clears throat> so there's a two-part problem. And immediately, immediately Nehemiah says, God, I have sinned and my fathers have sinned. God, I realize that this problem is self-induced. And I realize that you're correcting your children because we're still not right with you. God, it was our, it was our disobedience that led us into captivity and now we get a bright hope of a future that we're going to go and rebuild the temple. And it's our same disobedience that is plaguing us still. He said, enough is enough. Church, have we gotten moved to the point where we say enough is enough? Me and my fathers, we have sinned. Before we can be a voice that calls a nation back to God, we need to be a voice that calls ourselves back to God. The church needs fixing. And, and I'm the church. And I need fixing. And you're the church. And we need fixing. The church must lead the way in repentance because it's going to be repentance that removes the blockage that keeps us from hearing God. It's going to be repentance that brings back the voice that was silenced by hypocrisy in the church. I want to share just a little bit of a, 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 an article by Pastor Michael, uh, Michael Brown. It says, without a doubt, we have hurt our witness to the world with our hypocrisy, thereby undercutting our moral and spiritual authority. Why should people listen to us if we preach one thing and do another? How can we expose sin in the society when we're practicing sin in the church? On what basis can we speak out against gay marriage when we've allowed our own marriages to go to pot? We can't blame the world for not taking us seriously when so much of our own house is not in order. And we can only point a finger at ourselves and say, although we thank God for the multitude of godly men and women serving the Lord faithfully, and even sacrificially across America, we have been plagued by hypocrisy and scandals. And we need to lead the way in repentance and asking for forgiveness from both God and from people. Repentance blames no one else and makes no excuses. Instead, it takes full responsibility and makes an about face receiving mercy and restoration from the Father. Interestingly, the world's outrage against our hypocrisy suggests that the world actually expects us to be different as followers of Jesus. Meaning people expect us to be living godly lives. They expect us to be caring for the poor and needy. They expect us to have a different set of values. And so while worldly people may hate us for those very values, they still expect us to live by them. What people fail to realize, though, is that the righteous response to hypocrisy is not, the sanction, is not to sanction sin of the world or to lower the standards of the church. The right response is to change our ways, to put an end to our hypocrisy, to reestablish our high standards, and then call society as a whole to repent. <clears throat> In other words, can I read a little bit more? I need a drink. In other words, the right response to hypocrisy is not to say because we have had a plague of pornography in the church, we'll drop out of the cultural wars. Or because we have had so many scandalous divorces, we'll drop out, we'll drop our opposition to same-sex marriage. Why in the world would we do that? Why would we sanction our neighbor's sin because we're too guilty of sin? The right response is to repent of our own sin and then call our neighbor to repent of his or her sin. The right response is to say from here on, I turn from my sinful ways and I urge you to turn from yours. Somehow people think because we've been hypocritical at times, then the solution is to drop all opposition to sinful behaviors. But that makes no sense at all. To say, that's that teaching that we've taught you, told you about that says, I'll never be perfect, so what's the point of trying? If I'm engaging in the destructive behavior of alcoholism, but I'm encouraging you to break your drug addiction, the right response to my hypocrisy is not to say, I'm okay, you're okay. To the contrary, the right response is for me to get help for my alcoholism and to continue, you, to, continue to encourage you to get help for your drug addiction. 
Could you imagine a doctor saying to the patient, we're ashamed to say this, but while we've been treating you for cancer, we've completely overlooked that you have a serious heart condition. So to make things right, we'll stop treating the cancer. No, you continue until there's, there, there's victory. Of course not. In the same way, we don't stop exposing the sin of the world or worse, condone the sin of the world or even worse, celebrate the sin of the world because we've had sin in the church. Instead, we get our own house in order so we can help the world get their house in order. The best way we can help straighten out lives is by pointing them to Jesus and setting a godly example ourselves. But where we have been hypocritical, let us acknowledge it. Let us renounce it and let us redouble our efforts to stand for what is right in God's sight in both the church and in the society. One of the greatest revivals in history started by a man named Evan Roberts. And he went to a prayer meeting and his prayer was, Lord, bend us, bend us, bend us. It was repentance, it was brokenness. And then as he continued to pray, he started saying, Lord, bend me. Lord, bend me. Dr. Michael Brown's spot on. The, the, the problem is to get our house in order and then help get others. To lead the way in repentance that says, follow me as I follow Christ. I haven't been perfect and I haven't been where I should be, but I've repented and I'm going after Jesus and won't you come with me? We must fix the issues that are separating us from God if we're gonna be a voice for God. Evan Roberts prayed that prayer, God bend me, God bend me, God change me, bend me. Over 100,000 people responded because they heard a voice. The voice of God came into that man and he led over 100,000 people to Jesus. I say, God, bend me. And God, let my voice, let this voice, let our voice reach those around us. Let them hear something real, something full of integrity, something full of, of brokenness and repentance. Before we can ever speak, we've got to fix it. Before we can ever speak, we've got to hear his voice. Are we hearing his voice, church? Are we walking in, in purity, in intimacy, in closeness with God? I'm asking me just like I'm asking you. Can we truly say that we're walking that close? If not, we've got to fix it. The people of God should not be at a loss for word, the word of God. The problem's not with the, the, the voice that's speaking, it's with the ears that are listening. So we first we fix and then second find. Once we have fixed the issues in our own lives, we need to then seek God with all of our hearts and know his will and find his plan. I've just had these thoughts in my spirit just recently as I'm looking at the condition of our land, as, as I'm looking at, at the way that, that the Supreme Court's ruling against God and the president's going against God and, and the Congress and the laws and, and even the church is going against God and I see the destruction of the enemy all around. I just keep asking myself, God, what are we going to do? What should we do? And then the realization hit me, God's probably got a plan. Maybe God speaks to you in real, real deep things, but a lot of times it's like, hey, stop it for me, right? Hey, you, look here, right? It, 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 sometimes he doesn't speak to me just where I understand. Simple. But have we truly as a church asked God, God, what are you saying right now? God, what's your thoughts on the condition of our land? God, do you have a plan for us, your people? Have we been moved to truly be people of prayer? Henry Blackaby says this, if a Christian does not know God is speaking, he is in trouble at the heart of his Christian life. He goes on to say, if you wanna know the will and voice of God, you must devote time and effort to cultivate a love relationship with him. We not only need to fix what's going on, but we need to get rid of all the other voices, all the other distractions and attractions and everything else, and we need to get alone with God. We've gone to prayer meetings, but have we gone to prayer? I'm not downgrading the prayer meetings in any way, but if that's the extent of your praying for this nation, then we're coming up short. Have we gone and got on our face before God as Nehemiah did and said, God, what are you saying? God, what are you saying? Nehemiah said, for days I prayed, fasted and prayed. God, what are you saying? How can we ever have a good plan? How can we ever have a good response if we've never heard his plan? I've been taught my whole life, the most important person in the room should be the one that's making the call and the one that has the floor to speak. 
Now, I don't say that I'm the most important person in this room. I'm not speaking on my own behalf. And that's why I'm standing here. But the most important person should be the one telling us what to do. Have we given him that opportunity? The most important person should be the one that is speaking the most. Have we listened to say, God, what do you want me to do? God, I see destruction. Our enemy's not a Philistine giant. We don't see Goliath in the physical, but there's a Goliath in the spiritual. The enemy would, would, would come to attack. The enemy would come to steal, to kill, and destroy. So we are still in a battle. But have we responded? When you look at the heroes of the Bible, when you look at Joshua, anytime that they saw the enemy approaching or they saw God's correction on his people, what did he do? He hit his face. I just, I, the picture that I've had my whole life is he just, just flopped straight down. When Moses saw an enemy approaching, when the people rose up against Moses, when Moses saw God's correction on the people, what did he do? He stopped everything. Got on his face and said, God, what are you saying? And God, what do you want us to do? God, what are you saying? What do you want us to do? When David would approach a battle, when David saw the correction of God coming because he conducted a census, what did he do? He stopped everything and he prayed. Why? Because he wanted to know, God, what are you saying? And what do we need to do? We've got to have direction. We've got to hear from God before others can hear from us. We have to hear his voice before we can have a voice. We see bad all around us, but has it really brought us to our knees? Can we honestly say that we have responded truly in prayer? We've worried, we've complained, we've discussed, we've planned, but have we prayed? We fix the issue, but then we find the solution. God, what are you saying? Once we start hearing, we keep seeking so we can keep hearing. <clears throat> Verse 4 says, So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Nehemiah prayed, but how long? How long did he pray? It says many days. In verse 11, it says, O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. And let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. So in verse 4, he hits his knees and he begins to pray. In verse 11, he's making a plan to approach the king. You know what that tells me? He's heard from God. He realizes this is what needs to happen. But then we jump all the way over to chapter 2, and he gets his moment. Chapter 2, verse 1, and it came to pass in the month of Nisan. You want a godly car? I'm not endorsing Nisan. I can't do it. In the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, that I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had never been sad in his presence before. Therefore the king said to me, why is your face sad since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid and said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs lies waste and its gates are burned with fire? If you study these verses out, comment, commentary explains that it had been four months since Nehemiah had heard the report of the destruction of the people. He began to pray, and four months later, he goes before the king. Four months. Church, don't fizzle out. Don't stop praying. Don't stop praying. We need to pray like never before. This is our moment. This is our opportunity to have a voice, to rise up. He initially asked God he initially goes to God in prayer and then he asks God for favor with the king and then he gets his moment. See, Nehemiah had a position to open the door. Remember what we started with, God gives us the platform and then he also gives us the voice. Nehemiah was given a platform. Isn't it amazing that God's always got the right person in the right place at the right time? I thank God right now that we have a godly mayor. And that he has, has turned his ear towards our pastors. And that he has listened to the voice of the church of Cleveland already. Why? Because God has always put his right man in the right place at the right time. 
But Nehemiah knows that he's going to have an opportunity. He knows that he's going to be able to approach the king, that he's going to have the king's ear, and he, he, he begins to pray. Why? Because he doesn't just want the opportunity, but he wants that opportunity to make an impact. He wants to have a voice. So for four months, he seeks God and says, God, what should I say to the king? We have to hear his voice, church, so that we can have a voice. And then finally, the third thing was follow. We fix the breach. We fix what's breaking down our communication and ruining our witness. We find the voice and the plan of the Lord, and then we follow. God doesn't speak to us for our enjoyment, but for our employment. Not just so that we can say, oh, I heard from God, but so we can say, this is what God said, and we've got to do this. We've got to do this. Pastor James heard from God on a Wednesday night that we, the church needs to rise up and pray, and he didn't hold that in and say, you know what? God spoke to me tonight. Nee, 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 nee. God spoke to me, right? That's not what he did. He said, now we've got to go to work. Now it's time for us to pray. Now we, we come together. And God's continued to speak because he's continued to seek. And that's where the repentance came. That's where the repentance against racism came. That's where the multiple churches and multiple church services and, and, and types of church have come. God's continuing to speak, not for our enjoyment, but for our employment. God speaks to us for a purpose, and we have the responsibility of implementing what he's given us. His voice brings action. Isn't it interesting that we can, we, we can scream and shout all that we want to, but if it's our words, then it's going to come up empty. But the moment that God speaks, he empowers us, and when we bring a message from the Lord, when we bring a word that is truly God mandate, it drives action. It moves mountains. It moves people. It changes, it changes the surrounding. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 4, Then the king said to me, What do you request? So Nehemiah has prayed, He's gotten his opportunity. He's now before the king. And this is what he says. So I prayed to the God of heaven and I said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Then the king said to me, the queen also sitting beside him, how long will your journey be and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me and I set him a time. Furthermore, I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river that they may, must permit me to pass through till I come to Judah. And let a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, which pertains to the temple for the city wall and for the house that I will occupy. And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. You catch that? He had a moment. He got to go before the king, and the king said, okay, what is it? What is it? And right away, he spoke a plan. And not only did he say, I want to go back, but he said, I need provision. I need protection. I need, I, I need, some, I need you to, to tell the governors to let me pass freely. Protect me as I go. I need, I need some wood. I need some forest, some of your forests, so that we can build the beams of the gates. He had a strategic plan, a strategic response. That didn't come from Nehemiah. That came from Nehemiah fasting and praying for many days. And whenever his moment came, he had a voice because he had heard God's voice and it moved the king. And the king responded favorably. We see later on in, in verse 17, it says, Then I said to them, he's talking to the people now in Jerusalem. You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies wait and its gates are burned with fire. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach and I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me, and also of the king's words that he had spoken to me. So they said, let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. He came and he spoke to the people. They could have said, absolutely not, you're out of your mind. They could have said, we don't think you're the right guy for this project. They could have said, what do you know about building a gate? You're just a cupbearer. You don't have a lot of experience other than holding a glass. Are you sure you're the right guy? Nehemiah could have asked himself all of these questions. But he has a voice because he's heard from God. And he goes, and in the moment that he reveals his plan, whenever God gives him the platform, he had a voice. We have to hear his voice to have a voice. And immediately the people respond, let's do it. Let's do it. Church, can you see that God wants to do this in us? The world around us is looking for someone to speak up. They're looking for someone to speak up, but we have got to have something to say when the time comes. That's only going to come from being on our face before God and saying, God, 
There's wickedness all around. God, the enemy, is, is literally ravishing the work of the Lord. The enemy's coming against everything that we're trying to do. And I know that it's not as bad in Cleveland as it is in other places, but we've got to go to war because it's coming if not. Nehemiah says, God has given me this. And God's word in us gives us a voice. Once a person's been with the Lord and they've heard his voice, they have something to say. The greatest voice that we have is simply the echo of heaven that we have heard and we relay the message. I was thinking back a few years ago, <clears throat> the elders <clears throat> and Pastor James had, had, had presented an idea to go and remodel a church in Kennefick. Do y'all remember that? <clears throat> Before we did that, we had a meeting right here in church. And before that meeting, the elders had said, I want everyone to go in to pray. And we're going to come back and we're going to hear what God says about this little church in Kennefick. Do y'all remember that meeting? Charles Everhart was sitting about right here. And he raised his hand and he was very timid when he did. And he began to weep. And he said, I know that I know that we need to go and we need to save this church, and we need to rebuild this church because God's got something to do in Kinefic, Texas. And there was not another question. Why? Because he had been with God, and he had heard the voice of God, and as he spoke, it wasn't him, but everyone around him knew this is God's will. You can't manufacture the power of that moment. That is a God-spoken mandate. That is what the world around us is looking for the church to say. Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. God doesn't tell us things for our enjoyment, but for our employment. And y'all know that a project came after God spoke. A project came. What's the alternative that we just continue to sit and not listen and not speak and not have a voice? Edmund Burke says... And now I'm paraphrasing that evil will triumph when good men do nothing. But change comes when we implement the direction we were given while seeking God. We don't become a voice. We find our voice in him and we speak his word. And then we stand on this promise that we started with. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 11. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. Has God spoken to you lately? What's he saying? What is he wanting to do? So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. God has something to say about where we are as a nation, where we are as a church, where the church of Cleveland is, where the community of Cleveland is. Are we hearing is our, voice, is our voice tarnished by hypocrisy in the church? Have we found his will? Have we found his direction? And if he's spoken something to us, have we put it into action? Church, it's time that we become a voice again. It's time we become a voice. If we can, as a church, stand up with a God-given word, not something from the tacos that we ate last night. And I'm not trying to stir up some false prophecy that everybody's got a word and everybody heard from God. That's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about you go to your secret place. You go to the quiet place and you lay aside everything else and you say, God, what needs to happen? And so many times it's so simple. It's that person at your job. It's that person that lives down the street from you. And he drops him in there. It's a place that he wants you to go and pray for a school. It's something that he lays on your heart that you know what didn't come from you. And you follow that and you keep seeking and he tells you something else. And you do that. And then he tells you something else and you just go to somebody and you're in the middle of Walmart and you say, you know, I just got to tell you. God just wanted me to tell you that he loves you so much and you're released and you feel God I did what you wanted me to and you, you don't even know what happened 
Or maybe they just break down right there and you get to lay hands on them, lead them to Jesus or whatever. It's good for me to go and tell somebody that God loves them. But if God has mandated that, then it's powerful. It's always powerful. But if it's in, perf- if it's in God's perfect will, his perfect timing, then it's going to change things. Church, our jobs are looking for us to be the voice. Our families, our unsaved friends, our unsaved loved ones, they're looking for someone that is still standing while everyone else is collapsing. But we know that we have to hear from God if we're going to have something worthwhile to say. Is your heart burdened today for the condition of your land? Nehemiah's drove him to his knees for four months. And not only to his knees, but then he got up and he went after what God had given him. There's testimonies throughout history of a a church member in a back room praying and God giving them a vision and a word and they shared it with their leaders and God brought a move of God that was unexpected and, and it was through the simple prayer of a saint. God wants to speak. Are we ready to listen? We sing, show me your glory. But have we really went and pursued it? My heart's challenged today, church. I've seen the bad around me, but I haven't been given to prayer to the magnitude of the burden of my heart yet. I don't have an answer yet. But I'm going to go pray. I'm going to go talk to God. I'm going to hit my face. Because God, what are you saying right now? What what, what are you trying to tell us? And what do you want us to say on your behalf? God, we've tried to do it on our own. But what are you saying? What do you want us to say? Will you bow your head and pray with me this morning? I'm just going to go ahead and open the altars. And if, you, if you're here, Christian, and you want to go and, and just get before God, you go ahead.